Okay, can you hear me, Marla? Welcome. Sorry, it took me a little while to get started here. I was actually in between meetings and trying to get some lunch in between. So it's been a crazy day so far. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay, awesome. Thanks for being so patient. How are you today? So you're doing, doing good? Is it hot there? <laughs> Yeah, it's actually pretty nice here in, in Pittsburgh. It's probably in the mid 70s. Beautiful windows are open. Triple digits. Yikes. Um, the polls will be opening soon. Send it your way. <laughs> yeah, this is <clears throat> yesterday it was kind of gloomy, so this is kind of nice to have a, a sunny day today. Seems like all or nothing here usually. I'll try to send it your way. Don't send your, your humidity. Actually, you don't even have humidity. You're hot. I can take some heat. You can bring some heat our way, actually. <laughs> we just don't want the Florida um, humidity. All right. Well, welcome to week two, lecture session one. How, what did you think of last week's projects? Did you have fun with them? You love them? Yeah, I think this is a really fun creative class. I think this is a nice break from a lot of typical classes that you take, especially with design classes. Um, really gives you kind of a new, another perspective and um, taps into that other creative side. Yeah. Well, good. And hopefully, and I know I was like this when I was a student, um, in both undergrad and graduate, uh, studies that you know when I was going through certain classes I became more aware of of things that I was learning about in my environment so you know you might find yourself kind of being more aware of what's around you maybe photographs that you see now um, especially in advertising um, you know different different things uh, playing around with lighting as far as capturing different um, different styles and and uh, different looks with your camera whether it be on your phone or you know kind of playing around with it in Photoshop so it's kind of neat kind of play around with different things yeah the lighting has been interesting yeah and you know a lot of the times it's hard to teach the lighting part the aspect of that online because you guys don't have access to you know your own studio where you're coming into class and playing around with the lighting like we used to do when we were on you know taking photography uh, on ground at an actual college but there's so many different things that you guys can play around with even at home using different things that you have at home um, you know you can still gain a lot from it as well it's just you know you just don't have that professional and you might you might have that professional equipment but it's just knowing the techniques and all of that is kind of interesting. All right, so um, no questions as far as from what we went over in week one, no questions or comments. <clears throat> oh yeah, you found a site that showed you how to make your own reflectors, very cool. Yeah, if you wanna share that with us, um, if you have the link, I can, I can put that on the announcements too. Yeah, I think um, you can make them, you can buy reflectors to kind of bounce the light in a certain way on your subject. Um, so very interesting. Yeah, let me know that link. Oh, okay, it's in your discussion, okay. Gotcha. Awesome, yeah, you, you actually um, provided a lot of great information in your discussion post, so good job with that. All right, so just <laughs> just a few reminders, announcements. Don't forget, you know, I had, a, there's a, a few of you who haven't submitted your work yet um, for week one. So just as a reminder, make sure you're, you're getting that in within the one week late grace period. You'll have the 20%, you know, deduction for being late, but at least you're getting some credit and points in there. Um, the discussions are excluded from that, however, um, so make sure that you're posting within the deadline for that. And there's a reason for that. You know, people aren't going to go back from 
to the week prior to read your post and you won't be gaining as much from it. So that's kind of why that is the way it is. So just kind of a little, little announcement there. Week two work, we're going to look at your discussion, which is uh, all about portrait tips. And we are going to talk about your assignment for the lighting assignment for assignment two. And I think we're going to go into a little bit about the editing info. I'm going to show you some tools, but we really will be discussing more of the assessment to tomorrow. I'm going to break it up so it's not, you're not getting all of it at one time. And um, yeah, we'll do a little demo. I'll show you kind of some tools to kind of, you know, be aware of if you haven't already that will help you with your assignment and your assessment. All right, recap week two, question and answer. If you guys have any questions towards the end of the uh, lecture, and I know Marla, you're the only one in here, so if you have any questions, let me know. All right, before we actually get into the portrait, uh, into the tips here, let me go into Canvas quickly. Thank you. Just to show you our learning objectives for week two, it's always good to know, you know, kind of what we're gonna be going over for each week. So go ahead and click on week two. And this is what you should be walking away with learning from week two. So this is all included in your, not only your assignment, your assessment, your discussion, but also your reading materials and videos, supportive supplements that are added into this course and this class. So research and define a minimum of five photographic category subjects. Uh, define and discuss four principles of advanced digital photography techniques. Define and apply four approaches to a photographic composition. Define and apply various composition and lighting techniques to create a digital photographic image. Explore and apply various methods to enhance a photograph utilizing at least two digital effects. Edit and enhance photographs using imaging software. So this week we will be discussing portrait photography in detail and learn about how to use framing and angles in photography to get a good shot. So we will also be utilizing imaging software to manipulate and enhance our um, photographs. Um, there's a fun video here on seven do-it-yourself photography tips using household items that you can definitely check out. It's almost two and a half minutes long there, so definitely check that out. Um, so that's what we'll be going over today. It's uh, some interesting information, a lot about lighting techniques, and um, just learning about different categories that, you know, in, in regards to photographic categories. All right, um, I did post some announcements as well, so just, this is how I communicate with you guys as well. So make sure you're reading the announcements. I have the intro for week two, the learning coach information. And then I also posted this really interesting um, infographic that shows the three elements of exposure. Um, this came from this resource down here. So if you want to see more, there's a whole bunch of cheat sheets for photographers on this particular site. Go ahead and I don't know if this is a hyperlink. doesn't look like it. You might you just need to copy and paste this in your web user, your browser bar. But there are several um, very, very cool cheat sheets. This is one of the many that are on that site. Actually, let me go ahead and plug that in. I'll show you here real quick. Some really cool stuff on here. Can you see that? Can you see this website? Sure. I'm... Hold on one second. Okay, so this is the website and very cool. Um, so like I said, this is different info, infographics, which are great for, I, I think are great for anybody, but especially for designers, because we're, so we're visual people. We need to have that visual in a way too, verbal and visual. So a lot of these you can print out on your own if you think it'll help you throughout your, um, you know, throughout your experience here. So manual photography. So if you want to go through this cheat sheet here, it kind of explains visually and verbally uh, exposure, aperture settings, shutter, ISO. Um, and if, as you go down, you'll see different methods. So here's uh, three ways to affect depth of field. 
So changing the aperture based on how far the subject is um, that you're, you know, capturing their focal length, the distance. Uh, wide angle, if you're using a wide angle telephoto lens, kind of showing how that works on that infographic. This is the one I posted in discussions. I thought that was kind of cool, um, giving you a, kind of like a little cheat sheet of um, settings. Again, sh aperture, shutter speed. You can see a little guy there getting blurry as he goes slower there. ISO. So, and then this is the one that I posted. I thought this was like a really nice visual. And as you go down, you'll see different infographics explaining different topics here. So anyway, I thought this was really cool. Um, here's a portrait lighting cheat sheet. This might come in handy too, um, so that you can visually and verbally see the examples and how the flashes being used here, the angles of the actual flash. Here's portrait lighting for home studio. Yep. So we're talking about portraits. Here's shooting mode. So say if you're not real familiar with each mode and you don't have your manual, your actual manual to look at, this kind of gives you a nice little breakdown of what each of these settings are. Uh, based on Nikon camera, this is kind of where it's basing it off of. Here's um, metering patterns, you know, so it goes pretty in pretty de in big detail here in certain things. Uh, here's full length portraits. I just like this because it, it's there's so many different resources in here, I think, that are kind of visually interesting and then also help, very helpful. And you could just kind of pull it off onto your desktop and print it out if you find one that's really, really helpful or you want to take with you um, going out and, and playing around with it. Here's master backlighting. There's know your rights as a photographer, kind of interesting. Public versus private, commercial versus not commercial. Best shutter speeds for every situation. Yeah, brides. Yeah, because um, the contrast of the of the, you know, the what the lights kind of blow out could blow out the dress. That's kind of there's ways that you can get around that by setting your neutral. Um, there's actually gray cards is what they're called, and photographers, you know, hold onto those gray cards so they can meter their camera so that. It, you know, if they're in a situation where something could be very contrasted, say like a white wedding dress, they're setting that neutral point so that they're not, you know, it won't blow out in certain areas. So very cool. I wanted to give that uh, information to you. So if you want to look at that yourselves, the link down here, it's not a hyperlink. I didn't make it a hyperlink for some reason, but I can, um, is accessible there. So. But anyway, that's where the announcements are. Let's take a look at your discussions before we go in further with all the other information that we're going to talk about um, for this week. So let's go to discussion two. We're going to be talking about portrait composition. And I know, Marla, you just posted yours, so that's good. Go ahead and read through the learning objectives as well as the background here. And that basically goes, talks about portrait photography. Um, the prompts, so this is what you're asked to do for this discussion. So this week in our discussion post, you will research and discuss what makes a good portrait and what technique, techniques photographers can use to get amazing professional level portrait photographs and go beyond the snapshot. So you're going to research and discuss the following. Give two examples of advanced photography techniques that can be used to compose a good portrait photo. You know, how can you go about that? Talk about some of those techniques. If you don't know those techniques, go and research it. And when you do, pull that information. You know, don't forget to cite that information where you, where you took it from. When you cite that information, you know, cite it in your discussion post and then use your own words after citing it of summing it up. Find one example of a snapshot and one example of a portrait. This is visually. Compare the two images by describing what, what about the portrait photo 
makes it professional level portrait? And what about the snapshot makes it an amateur shot? What were advanced photography techniques used to make the portrait professional? Um, so you're seeing the, the comparisons. You should show two different comparisons that, that can be easily found online. And um, don't forget to cite your sources. Why is, it as, why is it important as a designer to understand the differences between snapshot and a good portrait? So those are the things that you need to address within your discussion. Don't forget to cite your sources, especially your visual examples. Um, you can also find articles from experts that suggest what, a, what makes a professional portrait. Uh, and don't forget, you know, if somebody is leaving something out, you read somebody else's post and they're maybe not, you know, they're leaving certain details out. That's when you can respond and kind of give them extra supportive information to support their perspective. Um, you know, and, you know, even if you guys exchange examples, that's always good to do too. Visual examples. Say, hey, I found this. This is really cool. Um, the differences between the two. This is a great example. You can respond in that way as well, just as long as you're citing your sources. All right, so we're learning about the differences between snapshot and portrait. Any questions about that? Yeah, Marla, I think you hit it. Um, you, I should say hit it, but I think you did a great job in explaining in your discussion post because you already posted. So obviously you are good to go. The only thing would be responding to your peers. Um, before I go on, did you ever hear of a snapshot picture before? Like, have you ever heard of it called that? A snapshot versus portrait? Okay, I guess maybe you were aware of it, but didn't think about the differences between the two. All right, very good. The only type you had, okay, the snapshot experience. Yep, so very good. It would be neat to do a project that that would be kind of a cool project to do for this this week since we're talking about that to do a snapshot and a portrait shot you know you guys doing both and showing the differences between the two that would actually would be a really cool assignment for you guys yeah so you can you know not just learn about it but also do it as well all right so let's talk about some portrait photo tips and tricks um, so when working with kids or families, take new natural sh pictures along with posed images. Kids especially, you can get better pics when they aren't aware they are being photographed. I think this is the most challenging part probably for a photographer, you know, with kids, they usually don't do what you want them to do. You have to <laughs> do reverse psychology and try all kinds of stuff. It's kind of fun when you go into an actual studio where they master the skill of gaining the the kid you know little kids attention because there's so many different tools and techniques that they try and that like, <laughs> I know when I was having my little girl photograph before it's kind of funny to see the things that they they do to make them you know smile the way that you want them to yeah Alter your perspective, especially moving too. They're very fast movers, so you have to get them to stay still. Alter your perspective. Your eye level is not always the right angle. So you kind of have to play around with that. Um, you might want to like get up on a chair or you know, angle in a different way. Ask your subject to look away from the camera instead of making eye contact. Adds a candid, more interesting feel to the image or ask family members to look at each other instead of the camera and adds a more personal and private feeling to the image. So there's different techniques that you can have your subjects do so it doesn't feel like it's a posed shot. It's more natural, more casual. Place your subject in interesting places in the frame, especially far right corner, left edge. Adds a dynamic to it where, you know, it, it's, you're not centering it dead center, you know, you're adding that uh, interest as far as setting it in the frame. Just think of it as like a, a layout and design. 
you know, some things aren't meant to be centered. Um, some things are meant to show motion and, and added interest. And so that's kind of the idea behind that. Use dramatic lighting, you know, try to play around with that and um, have fun with it and, and play around. And we're gonna kind of discuss a little bit on how to do that. But dramatic lighting is an interesting tip for portrait ideas. Introduce movements or props. Get your subject to join or blow on a pinwheel. There's different props that you can introduce and have fun with. I know when we take family shots of our family every year, you know, we are we can bring our own props or she has them there as well. And it's just, I don't know, it just makes it more interesting and, and it's you can make it a theme too. Uh, fill the frame with only your subject. That's an interesting way to go about it, you know. Instead of having it framed with what's around the subject, you're actually really blowing it up so you're capturing their essence. Work with natural light when possible. This is a huge, huge thing. I always say if, if, if you can never use your flash again, that'd be awesome. Flash is so hard to get a grip on with making your images look like it doesn't have a flash set, you know, on it. So if, if at all possible, try to avoid the flash. I mean, I know there's certain situations where you can't, but yeah, try not to use the flash setting. Um, so using ambient light out the window is, you know, being outside in diffused light, that's usually the best lighting. Use flash with natural light, it reduces shadows. There you go, there's a tip for you. Um, yeah, so if it's very contrasted outside, say if you're, you're shooting dead noon and you don't have any clouds in the sky to diffuse the light, that would be something that you definitely could try using the flash uh, for that. So you won't necessarily see it, but it'll help with the shadows like you said. Um, use more interesting backgrounds, you know, maybe um, if it's a, you're inside, you know, obviously you'll have to think about what you're showing there, furniture that you're using or whatever is in the background. Change the color mode to black and white or adjust the colors to make them more vivid. There are so many like uh, filters and things that you can download for Photoshop out there that are so mind blowing and so cool. They're like called actions and you can download them and, and then upload them into your Photoshop actions um, uh, presets so that you can apply it that action which is kind of like a filter it's just doing all the work for you um, and there's just so many cool different effects that you can do um, and a lot of photographers you know play around with those different effects and use that for a more dramatic look have your subject make different expressions funny faces etc you know make it look a little bit more visually interesting. Interact with your subject, have fun, laugh, and be silly. Um, you know, obviously, if you're doing a portrait for a commercial shoot, it might be, or for a professional portrait, it might be a little different in regards to that. But, you know, you can definitely see if somebody's, like, genuinely smiling and happy. Um, so, I don't know, just kind of some, some things to think about. Here are some examples of portraits. This is one that fills the frame we discussed before so you don't really see too much around her face here it's capturing you know the true essence of that the, her eyes coming through you're not being distracted by what's around on the outside because it's cropped in very tightly the hands too can be tricky when you're doing portraits hands can look very weird in this instance you know it's very I think that was done very well where you know it doesn't look like the hands are too big for her face <laughs> yeah it's natural looking it they don't look awkward you know sometimes you can get that awkward looking hand <laughs> here's one boy this looks like my little girl and this one is definitely it almost looks like an illustrated illustrative photograph to me um because of the way it's filtered there's a lot of uh, different contrasts going on here. It makes it almost look like an illustrated photo. Here's black and white with the, just the um, color being in the drinks. A different effect there. 
and cropping in on both faces so that you know you're zoomed in on what's important there nothing's distracting here's depth of field and you're capturing also depth of field and also the expressions of the kids being free and you know is not posed and not it's more natural you know Here's a new perspective that you can, um, you know, get a ladder out, get a step stool out, stand on something, get a different perspective on your subject instead of straight, like a head, like straight on to your subject. Here's another example of one where you're not having the image set in the center. You're, you know, having it on the, it's more asymmetric and more visually interesting that way. More natural light coming outside. Like it's swinging. Yeah, it does. Natural expressions again. Here's one with the lighting technique. The light coming, uh, in, it's actually set in front of her and also almost above her in a way. You can see her hair being lit up on the very top. Um, another one where the face is lit up, but the back part is not. So it's kind of darker behind the subject. So here's some lighting tips. Uh, the broader the light source, the, the more light, the soft the light source reduces shadows and contrast lessens texture. So it gets softer with the broader of the light source. The narrower the light source, the harder the light source. I mean, think of it as like a flashlight almost, you know. So you have the harder shadows, more contrast, etc. Diffusion, we talked about that with being outside with the clouds. Um, so diffusion, it scatters the light, makes it softer. You can diffuse by filters on lights, clouds are bouncing the light, reflectors, we talked about that. And that helps diffuse and spread out the light so it's not so narrow and hard on the subject. Lighting from the front only lessens texture uh, used often by portrait photographers, whereas lighting from the side above or below will emphasize texture. So if you're worried about seeing like pores on the face, looking older you might want to think about you know having the lighting from the front one talked about the butterfly effect under the nose was having the lighting above the subject that is used a lot for movie star shots yep headshots yep okay and it's something that you would never think about until you actually read about it and under you know kind of know how they did it that you're like oh yeah didn't even notice that very interesting. So playing around with those different lighting techniques is definitely something you guys need to be doing. Just play around with that if you can. Um, backlighting only can create a silhouette. So if that's something you might not want, you kind of think about when you're standing in front of a window and you try to take a picture of someone, probably not the best angle if you want to have more detail of that person. You want to Kind of direct them so that there are the lights in front of them instead of behind them but sometimes you want that effect so that's how you would create it all light has color which gives it tone warm more yellow cool is more blue uh, more more morning i should say and evening are warmer lights and different light bulbs have different tones so you know you typically they say a good time to shoot for a warmer type of a light even a diffused type of a light is between geez i want to say and, it, and this all depends on you know is it summertime if it's summertime it'd probably be any any time between seven to nine and at night as well because it's like right when sun sunrise and sunset happen there's that golden time is what they call it where the lighting is just right that you're going to really capture a nice warm image <laughs> it's always bright light unless you have uh, clouds, which probably, I guess you guys get clouds too, but very rare. Yeah. You have to walk around with an umbrella. 
shading and diffusing your light, a white umbrella. <laughs> so um, lighting can make or break an image. It affects the mood, the contrast, the texture. Um, I know I was taking a portrait of my grandfather the one time and I, my lighting was not straight on to his face. So I was getting a lot of texture on his face. And, you know, to him, it probably looked terrible because you could see every single pore and line on his face, you know, he was 80 some years old. So, but that effect that I was trying to get was showing his age for that purpose. I, you know, that, that's why I did what I did. But if you weren't going for that, you have to be mindful of the techniques that you're using. So you're not using the wrong techniques. Okay, so here's a visual example of how, you know, you can set up your lighting so that you have full coverage all around. <coughs> Say if you're inside, excuse me. You have the subject in the middle there is the blue dot, and then you have your side lights on the left and the right. You can also have your angled front lights, a front light, and a back light, as well as your back diagonal lights. So there are setups where you can actually um, light up a subject in this way to get a great portrait shot. Here are some examples of front lighting on the left. So the lighting is on the front for the one image on the left. And then side lighting example on the right. So you have two different effects there, not just you know black and color, but also how the lighting is hitting her face. So you might want two different looks. The image on the left that has the watermark on it is showing backlighting. So like I said, if he was standing in front of a window, you're getting, this is kind of the example here where you're getting more of a silhouette. A lot of the details you can't see within him because it's, it's being overshadowed. Um, lighting above on the very top image there with the guy looking up, that's the lighting from above coming down on his head. And then you have lighting from below. So those are two different looks. The one on the bottom almost looks like a horror movie, you know, when you have the little flashlight under your chin. So if that's something that you didn't want to get, you might need to control the lighting from below. Here's dramatic lighting examples. The one on the left is showing you a woman in front of a, what appears to be a window with blinds. You're getting that nice shadow of the stripes going across your face, it's kind of interesting. And the one on the right is um, dramatic lighting in the sense of, you know, you're seeing these little girls sitting at the table, the light coming through, almost capturing a moment, but you're not seeing too much detail because they're more silhouetted. Um, portrait lighting. So here's some examples of some portrait lighting. This would be, you know, lighting from all around your subject. Natural lighting, if you were to go outside and capture, you know, more uh, sunrise, sunset, um, or high noon, these are some examples showing you some outside natural lighting. Uh, basic three-point lighting setup. So, you know, this is if you had, like I said, access to lighting in a studio. Um, they're kind of showing you how to position the camera in a way where you're getting, you know, you're using a certain amount of light on each side for different intensities so that you're not getting a full blowout. You're, you're setting it up for a perfect portrait where your, your lighting is equally dispersed. So there's key light. Um, there's a thing called key light, and this is the principal source of light hitting your subject. It gives the viewer the basic shape of the object um, because during the day we see the principal light source, the sun coming from above. It is a good idea to place the key light above and to one side of the camera's point of view. So you'll see the subject there, key light only, and she's standing, if you see it on the right side of her portrait, you'll see how she's standing there and where the key light is. is uh, pointing on the very bottom right. Backlight is the illumination from behind the subject opposite from the camera. It distinguishes the subject from the shadow and further emphasizes the outline of the subject. So you can see that 
um, in full effect. You can see the differences between the top one and the second image of her portrait and how that's affecting it. And then you have fill light that will generally be a diffused light used to reduce shadows or contrast range and give a natural look to the subject. So if you look at the very top one and then kind of scan all the way down, you'll see how each of those different lighting um, situations kind of add to two different looks. You have Rembrandt lighting, and that is named for the Dutch painter who often used this type of lighting. It is characterized by an illuminated triangle under the eye of the subject. So you can see that if you're looking at this picture of her, her left eye, which would be, I'm talking about the left side of what we see. There's a triangle under that eye, that subject's eye. And it's created by using a key light and a reflector. So you can see that the key lights on the right side of the subject, the lights kind of casting that shadow from the nose and the cheek. You get that rem, remnant lighting, Rembrandt, sorry, lighting. Glamour, and you just talked about this, glamour lighting, aka butterfly lighting. One light source above and behind the camera is how to get this effect. So it's kind of interesting to uh, play around with these different, these different techniques. Side or split lighting. This is where you would actually have the light on the side of your subject and then you're pointing at their, their face to capture their, their portrait. Um, this is more of the silhouette lighting. So you have the, the subject with the light source behind the subject. All right, any questions about any of that? None. Okay. So that's just some tips and some things to think about to kind of play around with maybe different light sources if you have the opportunity to have different lights to play around with. I know it's hard. You guys, like I said, don't, you're not in a studio setting, but you know, even just playing around with different times that you go outside, maybe having like Marla said, making your own def, um, reflector, playing around with that um, is something that you can, you can do to uh, experiment. All right, so we're gonna get into your assignment two um, information here. We're gonna review it, see if you have any questions, and then we'll go forward. I'm gonna take a short break here, if you don't mind, five minutes. Sounds good, and we'll be right back.
All right. Thank you, Marla, for letting me know about that, by the way. Let's go on here. <laughs> All right. All right, let's take a look at your assignment information uh, for assignment two. I think you guys will really enjoy this assignment. And like I said, I'll be going over your assessment two tomorrow. Okay, so as always, you know, it starts with the learning objectives that are covered for this particular assignment, the background information behind this. So please read over this to give you a little bit of a, like an idea of what you guys will be doing. Um, they show you examples of different lighting effects here, just like we talked about. So please read through all of that. I'm not gonna read it word for word because I think you guys can definitely do that on your own. You don't need me to be reading over that. But the prompt here is what I'll be going over. Let me know if you have any questions. So this week you will be picking one of the following lighting situations to take pictures of for this assignment. The goal of this assignment is for you to visually see how light affects your images and subject. You will turn in a total of three to five images depending on your situation that you choose and include written documentation, so a minimum of 250 words, on why you chose the lighting situation to shoot, what subject you chose, and why, and finally, what effect did the lighting have on your images and subject. So, you know, maybe you wanted to capture a certain Per, you know, personality trait in the person that you're taking a picture of. So maybe the lighting that you chose is, you know, visually communicating this. So, you know, kind of explain this in your own words, um, <clears throat> kind of your thought process behind that. The assignment instructions, you're going to choose one of the following lighting situations to take pictures of for this assignment. Si size and save each of your images as a 5x7 or 7x5 JPEG. Okay, so here's your situation. You can choose uh, one of the three, okay? And once you choose one of the three, you're gonna be taking three to five uh, images of that in that situation. Okay, so situation one is available light, and that's outdoors, must be done on a clear, bright, sunny day. Choose a cityscape or landscape that you want to photograph and compose your shot, remembering to utilize good composition skills. Contrast, symmetry, color, rules of thirds, etc. You will take multiple shots of the same composition throughout the day. One before 8 a.m., one mid morning, one around noon, and one mid afternoon, and one late afternoon, early evening. So, for this particular outdoor shot, I think it might be good to just, if you have a place to set your camera to do that where it's always going to be pointing at the same in the same position that probably be the best thing if you have a tripod even better um, that way you can kind of keep it there it's just like if you can do it outside your house that'd be perfect because then you just have to go out and <laughs> take it every you know every so many hours um, to capture those time frames for your documentation pay close attention to how the color of the light changes how the direction of the light changes, how it changes what is lit and what is not lit, and finally, how it affects your shadows. For this particular outdoor shot, I would just put it on, um, I would just put it on automatic um, instead of dealing with the manual settings, because you don't really want to mess around with those settings if you're showing how each time frame looks a little different, maybe shadow-wise, with the, the lighting, uh, how the lighting changes. Any questions about situation number one? So that may take a little longer because you're, you know, having to do this in a time frame. Okay, situation number two is three-point lighting setup. In your reading and tools for week two, there is a video or reading about the basic three-point lighting setup. This is a technique used in photography and video production and is a very basic interview type lighting set up using three light sources. So a key light, which is the main light source, a fill light to fill the shadows, and excuse me, a backlight to give dimension. Oh, excuse me, D give dimension to the subject and distinguish them from the background. So you can see the diagram below. We'll take a look at this um, 
So for this lighting situation, you will attempt this lighting setup in a portrait shoot. So find a willing subject and place them in front of a simple uncluttered background. Arrange the lights as described in week two reading our video and take four pictures. These four pictures will be as listed here. So with the key light on only, with the fill light only on, third one with the backlight only on, and number four with all three lights on. And these could be just lighting lights that you have at home, particularly maybe more white light than yellow light. I mean, you, you use what you have, but um, you know, see, see what you can scrounge up for this. <laughs> um, if you have actual lighting, for like uh, an actual photo shoot, then definitely use that. For your documentation, talk about why you chose to attempt this lighting setup and who your subject is. Talk about how the different lighting directions and uh, how the different lighting directions and intensifies affected the photograph and and the differences you saw in each image. What was visible and in shadow and in each image? How did each light affect the final image? How did the mood change depending on what the light was on? So any questions about that one? You might, uh, well, you'll want to go in and, and actually look at that reading and video, okay, for more information. And then situation number three, dramatic lighting effect. For this situation, you will choose three dramatic lighting effects to attempt from the .pdf document located in the reading and tools labeled dramatic lighting setups. In the PDF are instructions on how to set up the lighting effects and examples of how they look. Find a willing subject and place them in front of a simple uncluttered background for the photo shoot and utilizing whatever available light source you have, so light from a window, flashlight, lamp, etc., to attempt to recreate the three dramatic lighting setups as described in the attached document. For your documentation, just discuss uh, why you chose the three effects you did, who was your subject, and what lighting sources you used to create the image. Also note which ones worked and which ones didn't. Talk about any difficulties you have had, and finally talk about what type of mood was created with each of the uh, effects. So if you click here, it should take you right to that, um, it's a hyperlink here, to the uh, course media page. So you can go down to week two, and so there, there's different articles, and I think there's a video, here's the PDF here actually a website too and videos down below you have to access the um, lynda.com for that let me open that pdf just to show you real quick what that was talking about in that in the outcomes there okay so basically, um, these, this is the PDF that is um, provided to you guys. You can um, take a look at each of these different effects and play around with, uh, you know, kind of how to do this. It gives instructions here. We just talked about some of these too. Yeah, you have Lightroom that will give us the effects of filters such as actions. Oh, will that give us the effects? Um, hmm. You'll well, you'll have you can do different things in in Lightroom. Yeah, um, you can do different, almost the same things you can do in Photoshop. It's only you're dealing with the raw image. Um, so you could do different lighting techniques even on the image after the fact but it's always good to kind of capture that in the moment when you're taking that picture, not doing it actually in Photoshop. But yeah, you, there's definitely, you can play around the histogram in Lightroom. Um, pretty much the same things that you do in Photoshop, it's just you're dealing with the raw image instead of the actual JPEG, which is giving you a little bit more pixel information from that image. So this is the PDF that's given to you that kind of gives you some, some tips on how to capture the different uh, effects here, lighting effects. 
So definitely check that out. And then, like I said, oh, let's see here. It goes all the way down here. So you have a lot of information here. Um, so a beginner introduction to Lightroom presets. You can click on that and check that out. If you're new to Lightroom, this is a nice, uh, you know, we were just talking about Lightroom. Here's the presets available online. So yeah, there's different uh, filters, I guess you could say that, um, that are presets that you can upload. It's kind of like actions. Um, so then uh, we talk about, you know, Photoshop verse Lightroom image editing, which is kind of interesting to see the differences. So you can read through that and see what the differences are, strengths and weaknesses of both. Oops. Sorry about that. It's like all kinds of stuff popping up here. Weaknesses of each. So you can kind of decide on like which way you want to go. Um, here's download and install a room if you haven't done so already. Dramatic lighting effects. Here's uh, we just we just uploaded that, and then the rest of this is um, really helpful information for how to compose a portrait uh, photograph. Some tips and tricks in these videos that will definitely help could help you guys. Um, and then it all all goes down to the Photoshop uh, tools that we will also be discussing. And this will, will be something that we'll really be heavily discussing tomorrow for your other assignment. Okay, so any questions about assignment two? Do you know kind of the direction that you wanna go? Which situation you wanna do? None, easy, you're so easy. So each one of these has its own technical aspects to it that you need to pay attention to. Use the PDF info. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, if something's not working out, you can try another one, you know, you can try all three if you like, just to, just to see which one you got the most um, results from that you enjoyed the most. Uh, the only one that you need to really plan out more so time-wise is the outdoor one, especially with your time frame for your deadlines. And, uh, you know, if it's nice out, it could be raining, you know, you just never know. So you might need to plan that out a little bit more. All right. So don't forget, you're going to pick one of the three options, you're going to choose submit three to five images, you have to make sure that they're either five by seven or seven by five. <laughs> rain, what is that exactly? Well, we know rain here in Pittsburgh. Trust me, we've had nothing but rain all April, month of April. So April showers, you can have it. We have like landslides and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We actually had snow the end of April too. So <laughs> nothing surprises me. All right, and don't forget the written part of this. Don't forget to document, um, you know, your reasoning behind what you, why you chose the situation that you chose. Talk about your subject, you know, bring in supportive factual information about the category that you decided to go with. All right, so um, now we're gonna kind of switch gears here because we, we were doing, we were kind of covering the assignment too, which involves portrait shots and kind of getting a different effect on your portrait shots. As we go into tomorrow for the live lecture, I will be going into a little bit more in detail about the photo manipulation part of it. So we're just kind of going to brush upon certain things now for that. And then tomorrow we'll be meeting around this certain time and I will, I will kind of give you more of a, of a demo for compositing. Um, so what is, we're talking about assignment two, which you will be compositing an image. Do you know what compositing means? When somebody says a composite, what does that mean?
composing. Yeah. So you're, it's not, you're just not taking a picture of one subject and then that's it. You're actually combining a whole bunch of images together to create one image. And it doesn't have to be a whole bunch. It could be like one or two different images that you're putting together into one image. So that's what a composite is in uh, kind of what we're talking about here. So it involves transforming or altering a photograph using various methods and techniques to achieve a desired result. Depending on the application and intent, some photo manipulations are considered an art form because it involves the creation of unique images and in some instances, signature expressions of art by photographic artists. Here's some examples. So when you see things like this, you're like, oh my gosh, how did that work? How did that happen? It was, it's a photo composite. And I think this is one of the things that can cross the line. And in these, obviously, you know it's a composite, but some people actually composite images to make it look like it, it's an actual, just a photograph that's real. So, um, you know, I'm sure all of us have seen those type of, of either videos or images before. But these are definitely, you know, that this isn't the original image. You see this big guitar in the background. You have that perspective. The lighting's all, it almost looks like it's a real photograph of that. The one on the right, you know, it's a very cool manipulated image where the, um, the ocean is being, it's almost like a rug where she's propping it up with the stick and sitting underneath it, reading a book. Um, and this can be done in Photoshop. Kind of cool. You also have, you know, this is, this is where you, you know, once you start knowing how to manipulate and color correct and, you know, do different things with photographs, you might have some new best friends calling you saying, hey, can you photo Photoshop my image or my portrait? Um, so there are before and afters that, you know, these people look like what they look like. There's Madonna on the, on the right there. Um, you can see kind of the original photograph on the left and then how it was manipulated to look enhanced on the right. Um, and this is, a, this is something that, you know, can be very debatable in, in the whole advertising aspect of it as far as what you see, um, you know, false advertising in, in regards to that. You know, you're Photoshopping, so it's not the actual image. You're actually enhancing it. Here's a composite examples of, um, portrait of portraits of people. There's a little kid here, and then the face of a tiger kind of composited on top. Same thing on the right there. She's uh, there's a portrait of her on the left, and then um, placing another image over top. Yep. Yeah, and um, I actually did a, I did a paper, a thesis paper on this in grad school, and it was about our responsibility as designers to, um, and it had to deal with um, photo objectifying women in advertising. So what that means is you're photoshopping them or showing them in a way that is objectifying them, making them instead of a person, they're an object. And how designers have, have more power than we think we do to um, not have any, you know, not have involvement in something that is, could be detrimental to society. And there's facts and all kinds of stuff, you know, about kindergartners who are now on, on um, diets. You know, there's a certain percentage now of kindergartners on diets for the girls because they want to be what they see, you know, in the billboards and the advertising advertisements that you see and there's no there's no way anybody can measure up to that because it's not even real so there's a social responsibility that's put out there um, that designers need to be aware of that you know do you want to be a part of that uh, and that's a tricky there's a there's a thin line there you know it's a tricky thing and there's ways around it there's tools that you can do to you know protect yourself and support you as a designer but Yep, Twiggy, yep. <laughs> exactly. But you see a lot of um, brands that come out with, it's kind of um, dealing with the subject in a more proactive way where they're raising awareness about this, like the Dove campaign, the beauty campaign, where they're actually showing real women. They're not Photoshopped. 
you know, and that's, that's kind of, it's kind of changing in a way in re that regard. So that's good. But I, I definitely think that it will always have that as an issue in advertising. And that, that goes for food too. There's food that's Photoshopped, you know, there's food that we see on commercials and in advertisements that aren't actually food um, because it doesn't photograph well. So there's other things in place of whatever that food is to make it look better. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I think there's just more awareness of it now. All right, um, so the software that we use is, that you can experiment with is Lightroom and also Photoshop. So Adobe Photoshop Lightroom is a photo processor and image organizer developed by Adobe Systems for Windows and Mac OS. It allows viewing, organizing, and retouching large number of digital images. Um, Lightroom's edits are non-destructive. In addition, the application has a variety of presets, presets which can be downloaded or created and applied to images, just like Photoshop. And there's pros and cons, like I said um, before we were looking at that. Spot healing brush tool. This is like, could be one of your favorite tools. Have you ever used this before? The spot healing brush tool? Yeah. I know, it's, uh, now there's apps that you can get this little awesome little tool here to, you know, take a blemish off your face or. <laughs> or whoever. So the, the spot healing brush tool, if you're not unfamiliar with it, it does a remarkable job of autom automatically matching tone, texture, and color, say on your face. Um, it is the default healing tool in Photoshop and can be used to clone areas from an image and blend the pixels from the sampled area seamlessly with the target area. The basic principle is that the texture from the sample area is blended with the texture and luminosity surrounding wherever you paint. The main difference between this and the standard healing brush is that the spot healing brush, require, brush requires no source point, so you don't have to hold an alt option to uh, select the pixel information. Um, the proximity match mode, which is also available, analyzes the data around the area where you are painting. This is with the spot healing brush tool to identify the area to sample the pixel information from. So that's why I was saying that proximity match mode, if you have that chosen, it's taking that um, information around wherever you're selecting as you're, you're selecting that with the alt option tool on your keyboard. Um, it's kind of sampling that pixel information around it. Um, the create texture mode works in a slightly different fashion. It will read in the data surrounding the area you are attempting to repair. As you do this, it will generate a texture pattern from the sample data. So, it's interesting. The spot healing brush also features a content aware mode, which intelligently works out how best to fill the areas you retouch when you use the spot healing brush. So the content aware mode is, is kind of really interesting. Um, we'll take a look at some of these too as we go forward. Uh, image adjustment, so brightness and contrast, you have that ability to adjust and they're simple as they get. So to make the image darker or lighter, brighter, so I should say that, you can just move the brightness scale to the left or to the right respectively. Same thing with the contrast. Move the contrast scale left or right to decrease or increase image contrast. Um, you have exposure adjustments, so adjust any of the following. You can adjust the exposure. The option adjusts uh, mainly the highlights and pretty much ignores the darkest shadows. The offset is the option dar darkens the shadow and midtone values and leaves the highlights alone, so it's the opposite. And gamma correction, this option adjusts the image's gamma or midtone values. Black and white and curves is another feature in image adjustments in Photoshop. In black and white, not all black and white images are created equal. Kind of interesting. Simply desaturating your image is one of the worst things you can do to ruin a true black and white feel. So you don't really want to go in and desaturate that. When using black and white adjustments, Photoshop is giving you more control over contrast range of each color by um, arranging individual color contrast to most suited positions, you can make your black and white image pop and stand out from the crowd. However, this is often a, a very 
tedious task, and that's why Black and White uh, Panel also offers presets and auto button to help you with those corrections. The Curves tool provides up to 14 control points for highlights, midtone, and shadow adjustments for individual channels. In the Curves adjustments, you adjust points throughout an image tonal range. Initially, the image's tonality is represented as a straight diagonal line on a graph. And I'll show you this in a second. When adjusting an RGB image, the upper right area of the graph represents the highlights, and the lower left area represents the shadows. You have the clone stamp tool, and that paints one part of an image over another part of the same image, or over another part of any open document that has the same color mode. Clone stamp tool is kind of a, a neat tool. You can, you know, grab, say, like the eyeball on somebody and, and do a third eye with it, stamping it. It's kind of cool. Point the cursor at the image you want to paint with and hold down the Alt key, then mouse click you have just selected the source point for cloning and then you can kind of stamp it. All right, um, let's talk about this terminology. You have image size in Photoshop. So the image size, and, and I'll show you this in Photoshop too. The image size is the image dimensions in pixels, the actual print size. Image measures X uh, number of pixels by Y number of pixels. You also have the resolution. So you, you have to worry about image size. And you have to be aware of this because you guys will be making sure that your images are five by seven as far as the image size. And then the resolution is how many pixels are in one linear inch of an image. So it affects the quality of the image. The professional print standard resolution is about uh, 300 pixels per inch. So 300 wide by 300 tall. So 90,000 pixels per square inch. If you're printing a high quality photograph, you want it to be at least 300 pixels per inch. You have megapixels. For example, 12 megapixel camera is what they're talking about there. It means a camera can capture up to 4,000 pixels wide by 3,000 pixels tall. So 12 million pixels for 12 megapixels total in the image. Some things to be aware of. Ooh. All right, so with that being said, let me open up an image here in Photoshop. Oops, Let's see if I can find it. I'm actually going to close my window. I don't know if you guys can hear it. They have cutting our grass behind me and I don't want you guys to hear that noise. Hold on one second. Okay. All right, so what would, what would be this for an eight mega? I don't know. Can you re rewrite that? I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. So if you have 12 million pixels, it means it's a 12 megapixel total in image. So if you have eight megapixels, it means it's eight million pixels. That makes sense. All right, I don't know if that like answered your question. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, let me go into Photoshop here. I don't know if, am I sharing my screen here? Let me see. Okay, so this is a before and after. This is a good example of what you can do to manipulate and enhance a photo. So the image on the left is the original image, and then the one on the right is definitely altered. It's manipulated. Double click on here. So I wanted to just show you some of the tools that we were talking about um, so that we're all pretty clear on that. So you have the spot healing brush tool. And if you just put your cursor over top of that um, icon, it's actually going to show you intuitively a little example video here. So it removes marks. Um, I showed you here. Removes marks and blemishes. So you can click on that and zoom in on your subject. 
And when you click on that, notice the presets change up here. What I mean by that is every tool, as you click down here to, on every other tool, you'll see the presets change above. And that just is allocated to that particular tool. So you can actually go in here and change the size, say of your brush, the hardness around the brush. So you can have it more like fuzzy around it. The harder it is, you know, you'll you might see more of a line around it where you're you're sampling. Um, the spacing is just kind of spacing out um, parts of the brush so that you're, you know, you're doing it in a way where it's it's not going to be overlapping. Pen pressure, you know, if you have a tablet, this is something that you'd want to take note of. If you have a stylus, um, you have different uh, modes, so you can, you know, set a different blend on your actual selection. So if you wanted something to, like say you wanted to just affect um, the color or luminosity of the image, you would choose those. You could do a screen, a darker and a light, lighter. It's almost like a blend mode. Content aware. Oh, sorry, getting messages here. Hold on one second. I thought I'd turn that off. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so um, sometimes I try, I try to like log out of there and, and it comes back, my message is here. All right, so content aware, we were just talking about that where it actually takes in consideration of the content pixels around it. Um, and that's what I had this on uh, initially. If I was doing texture, like more of a textured pattern, I would choose create texture, proximity match, like I said before. Um, oops, let's see here, hold on, the heck, it's going to sample around the proximity of where you're clicking to get the, you know, the, the closest pixel information that's uh, around it, so, you know, you're not it's not looking odd, like for instance, in that particular area there. Yep, they did. So I would say if you ever do something like this, um, here I'm holding on the alt key so I can actually, oops, I, I actually don't have to hold this with the, the actual, uh, the spot healing brush tool, you don't have to hold down the alt key to grab pixel information, but the healing brush tool you do, okay? Um, but yeah, they also did a lot of other things to this, but taking care of the um, blemishes and anything weird in the photograph is, is what I would do first before doing any other color correction or um, any other effects here. And what they, what it seems like they did was there's different ways that you can do this. Um, after you do your, your blemishes, what you could do, and let me, let me crop this out here to make it look better. You could do different things with layers. So you can copy this layer. You can give it a blur. Oops. Sorry. Go up to you could do all kinds of different blurs. There's surface blur, smart blur, shape blur. I'm gonna do Gaussian blur. That's kind of like all around type of a blur there. And what's nice about this, it kind of gets rid of a lot of like wrinkles or stuff that you have going on. Um, so you can have this set, I'm gonna set it at two pixels, and then you can set the opacity so not all of that is being shown, or you can throw a mask on it. And a mask is nice because once you set a mask on there, you just click on a little mask icon, you take your paintbrush tool, and you can go in and actually paint over more of the 
specific parts of the eye or details of the face that you don't want necessarily blurred. So I'm just kind of clicking and dragging over. So I'm not losing that detail. And I, this is actually, this is at 100%. I can dial this down opacity-wise um, just to give a more natural look. So that looks a little bit more natural there. But you're giving a nice blend to this so that you don't see as many. See how I'm kind of doing it before and after there? Kind of gives a nice smooth look to it. Now I didn't do um, I didn't do a lot of color or spot healing brush tool clicks onto his, you know, face. So you'll see a lot of the marks still there, but you can see the texture of the face gets a little bit smoother. And then at that point, you can start putting the adjustments, layer adjustments on there. So you would go to image adjustments, and this is kind of, we talked about levels and curves before and brightness and contrast. So let's do that. Let's go up to image adjustments and brightness and contrast. So if you, oh, this is going to show my, <laughs> this is funny. Let me cancel that. Adjustments. I might have to go back and redo this here. Yeah, so you can see <laughs> as I go, you know, over the brightness. Now I have a mask on here, so it's going to look weird. The brightness and then the contrast you can play around with here. You can just hit the auto button if that works for you. Sometimes the auto button doesn't work as well. Levels is, you know, you can adjust the um, brightness and the darkness and neutral tones here as well. So you have these little f-stops. The one on the left here is your dark f-stop. And well, I don't want to say f-stop. What are they? Um, stops. They're just called stops. Uh, the one on the right is a white stop, and then this is your neutral. So if you slide this to the right or the left, this is affecting more of the neutral part of the image. You can see there's not much uh, line here showing that there's your, you know, you don't have a lot of white showing in the image. So as you pull that to the left, you're going to gain more brightness throughout the image. Same thing here, just going the opposite way with the dark part. There's an auto setting. We can actually just click on auto setting. That'll just adjust it based on, you know, the image. You can actually select each individual channel. So if you just want to affect the red parts of the image, you can choose the red and kind of affect that, change that. <coughs> Layers, adjustment layer, <coughs> excuse me, curves. <clears throat> so if you put a curve on there, just as I said before, the upper right-hand corner is your lights. The lower left-hand corner is your darks. You can also see your, um, your black point here, which is your eyedropper tool. So this is your black tones. This is your white point. So it's your lighter tones and neutral. So what you could do here, and I don't know if I have this selected appropriately here. Let me click on him and then go back here. Oops, sorry. Let's go back up here. So with curve selected, <clears throat> I'm going to choose the dark, the black point, and I'm going to hold down the alt key. And it's showing me what that looks like on that one. Okay, hold on one second. This is just hard because I have all these other masks on here. Oh, let me, let me trash this. I didn't realize it was giving me some copies here. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna trash all of these just to kind of give you guys a better understanding of this. Or start from scratch. Okay, so <clears throat> here we go, curves. There are some curves back here. All right, so select the black point, 
and then hold down the Alt key. When you hold down the Alt key after you select the black point, it's going to show you all the darkest points in the image. So it kind of changes to white. You'll see some blue down here. So anywhere where it's a darker color, I'm just switching back and forth from the Alt Option key, you'll want to sample from. And this will set your darkest dark point. Same thing with the light point. Do the same thing. Let's zoom out here. Alt key. And it looks like down in this lower right hand corner is where the lightest point is of your photograph. So this will just set, um, it'll set your high, your light point to the highest and then adjust your, it'll kind of change your whole overall image color. So let me go, let me do an undo so you guys can see what I just did here. Go to history. Okay, let me go right back up here and you can see the difference. So it kind of changed the overall color of the image. So that's another way to adjust your brights and your <clears throat> darker points and your neutral point. I'm going to delete this. And then you also have, okay, here on then. Let me pull this over. Here we go. The layers are getting all crazy here. There we go. Um, you also have under the layer, new layer adjustment, exposure. And this obviously affects the overall exposure of the image. So you can go darker or lighter. We we're just talking about the offset of that and then the gamma connection or gamma correction. So this would be your dark point, I'm sorry, your lightest point, medium, like your neutral point, and then your darkest point. And you could do the same thing here where you select, you know, the darkest of the darks. So there's different ways to do a million different things in, in Photoshop. You don't have to necessarily go with all of those settings, but choose the one that you think would work best for your image. All right, what else did we talk about? Oh, the, um, this is the clone stamp tool. No, this is just one that I'm showing as an example. Yep. When we take, the one that you take, what do you mean? What do you say, man? That you can alter? Yeah, so um, this is more so for, you can alter your images as far as, you know, if you have blemishes in the portrait that you're taking. I wouldn't change the lighting for the first assignment too, if that makes sense, because some of the shots you want to make sure the lighting is done before you take the picture, not after. Um, but if you want to kind of clean up your portrait shot, you can definitely take it into Photoshop and do some spot healing on the skin if you have things that you want to you know, get rid of. The ass assessment too, you, you're going to have more of an image manipulation to deal with. So some of these tools will come into play more so for your assessment too. And like I said, we'll be going over that tomorrow. So yeah, just kind of like an intro to some of the tools. So this clone stamp tool is really neat. You just, um, this will clone anything that you're, you're going to select here. I'm going to hold down the alt key and my brush is really big and you can alter the brush size. Like I said up here, um, in this preset or even a shortcut key would be right in your parentheses and brackets. So as you, the left bracket is making my, um, brush smaller and the right bracket is making it bigger. So just for purposes of showing you this, what this tool does, I'm going to make it a big brush and I'm going to hold down the Alt Option key right over top of his eye and click right on top with the Alt Option key selected. Then I'm going to let go and put my cursor here. This is where I'm going to stamp it. Oh, what am I doing? Hold on, let me get my layers here. It'd be good if I didn't have that layer. It has to be right on that layer. So I'm going to do that again, and I'm going to stamp right, right on his forehead. Now, it's, 
this is a great way to kind of play around with some people. You know, if you wanted, you know, you might not necessarily do it in this way, but maybe say you have a portrait of somebody who's closing their eyes and in one picture they're open and the other picture they're closed. You can clone stamp their eyes if it's on the same angle. Um, you can you can do a clone stamp and put their eyes open. I've done that before with Christmas, you know, photos of my kids that, or my kid that, we loved the picture, but her eyes were closed in one of them. And it was the same setup. All I needed to do was clone stamp her eyes so it looked like it was there open. So um, that's definitely a really cool tool to play around with. There's the pattern stamp tool as well. Um, this will basically stamp patterns that you can choose. And my pattern is up here, um, presets. You can upload new patterns as well and play around with that. But this is a uh, kind of a cool thing to play around with. Typically when you do this, you wanna make sure you have another layer showing so that you can kind of manipulate that a little bit. You know, it's not going right over your image. Makes it look older. What did you say here? Wait, when you, when you clone stamp the nose into the eye, it makes it look older. Like it makes him look older. That's funny. Go back several. Okay. Where's my history? History is great. That's kind of like your big undo. I don't know if I. I think I deleted that section of it with the eyeball. Yeah, because I don't have anything else other than that. Um, I think it's because I deleted it. <laughs> Sorry. Let's bring up layers again. So just alt click and then pay attention up here. This is the opacity. If I wanted that full opacity on that eyeball, I would dial that up so that it's not so like, you know, it's more clear, I guess. And you can stamp that, oops, you can, as long as you're sampling the image, so alt clicking right over top, that's kind of what you're stamping to place on there, wherever you're kind of placing it on. <laughs> So you can do some interesting things. Um, that's kind of like overkill, obviously, but you, hopefully you get the idea. Mm. All right, you have the content aware tool as well. You have all these different, so the healing brush tool is similar where you're, you're gonna be clicking over top of certain details that you wanna get rid of, like say this hairline, you kinda wanna just click on it and get rid of it. Kind of clicking and getting rid of that hair that's distracting and making it look messy. So that is the healing brush tool, patch tool. You can actually patch an area. So let's say, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Let's say you wanted to, and this is a hard example because it's better when you have like a landscape or something and you're, you're trying to fill in a void. Let me bypass this for a second here. Oh, the red eye tool too. You can take out the red in an eye. Let me see if I can find a landscape picture here. I think that would be better to show you guys. Hold on one second here. Yeah, okay, let me just, this is a very low res image here, so just kind of bear with me. But I think it's a little easier to show you what this tool does with this. Paint his eyebrow to a unibrow. There you go. I could do that, actually. 
the content aware tool. Let's do that. So what I would do is I would just paint where I'd want that unibrow to be. So I would like not paint it, but kind of select that area. And I just clicked and, and kind of drew around this area here. And then all I need to do is after I make that, I just click and drag over and it slides the, the, con the pixel information that I want over into that area. I don't know if it's actually gonna work, but. It's kind of changing the color. Kind of a uni brow here. <laughs> All right, let me open up that other image so we can I can show you real quick. Like I said, this is a low res image. Okay, so say I didn't want this tree in here. I wanted just kind of a very flat surface. I would just oh sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing. Just go around the tree itself. Oops, maybe. And I would, you know, make sure that it's not right on the edge of the tree. And then once you make that selection, go to the right or to the left and then line it up appropriately. I may need to kind of move some things around here, but if I can use the arrow keys, no, I can't. That's a little better. We got some lines showing though. That's because I moved it. Let me do this again. I think I messed this up. Hold on, hold on. There we go. So I'm just pulling and dragging and then I deselect. And then you can go in there and, and fix some information, but it's kind of cool. You can, you can replace trees or whatever you have going on. All right, so when you guys are working on your um, photos for this particular assignment too, what I would do is See, let's go file open and let me open up let me open up this image again this is gonna be a low res but say this is the picture that you took that you you um you you took with your camera it's the situation that you picked take it into photoshop go up to image go to image size and make sure that this is in inches on the right here you want to make this five by seven or seven by five, depending on um, this is getting close as, as it can get. So seven by five. Um, if you need a crop, but you can. For some reason, this is uh, you can go to canvas size and actually make the actual canvas size uh, width is five by seven. Mine is very small image, so that's why I'm having that, that issue there. It's a very low res, but you shouldn't have any issues with that. Layer, layer, layers. So let me see here real quick. Let me get a, let me get a regular image so it's a better example here. Make it portrait. Unlock it, yes, I have to unlock that. I'm just gonna get an image that, it's a high res, higher res image. I'm gonna put it on my desktop here from a site and... Okay, so I'm gonna go file open. Okay, go image, image size. Oops, go up to layer. Oh, my ears are showing. Unlock. Image size. 
And this one's square, so we might have to do some changes here. Let's do seven by, let's do five by seven. So if this is the case, say you cropped it where it was a square, um, what I would do is I would just go to canvas size and change this in here first. Now it's gonna crop it. So, you know, if you need to kind of be aware of that. So if you need to resize it, go up to edit, transform scale, hold the shift key down and you can actually get it to fit a little bit more in, into this area here. Image size, go back to that and just make sure that this, oh, mine's 72, so I wanna change that. I'm gonna do resample. I wanna make sure this is 300 pixels per inch. Now this is a low res image, so that's why it's gonna look a little crappy, but yours, yours should be good. So this is five by seven, with it's five by seven and it's 300 pixels per inch. So this is kind of similar to what yours should be. Although it doesn't have to be seven by five, it could be five by seven. These can be switched depending on the orientation. You can see the image size is nine megapixels. You can see the, um, I'm sorry, nine megabytes. Dimensions are 2100 pixels by 1500 pixels. Um, so that's kind of the information that you can find there. And when you're done, what does it say to save it as? Let me see here. It doesn't quite say in your assignment two what to save your images out. Oh, JPEG, okay. So you're just gonna go and save it out as a JPEG. So save as JPEG. And I would do like image one, desktop. So you'll have three of those images that same size that you're gonna zip for submission. Let me go back to that information here so you can see it. So here's where it says five by seven JPEG. And then down here is what you, how you submit it. So you'll name the zipped file this name with your first and last name. And you'll submit that zipped compressed file for grading. So I'll unzip it and I should have those three um, images in there. And then also your documentation. So if you want to, you can have I would, this is what I would do. I would submit the three separate JPEGs as separate images and then do a Word document without having your images in that Word document. The only reason being is I want to make sure you're doing the right size uh, for your images. So it, your images won't be embedded into the Word file. Um, it could be Word or PDF as long as you're zipping it all together with your three images. Yeah. So don't place your images inside the Word document. Have those three separate so I can open each one of them up. And then just save it as a JPEG. Each, um, each of those three images, you can save your Word file as a doc file or you can export it out as a PDF. It's completely up to you. All right, any other questions, concerns? This is probably where I'm gonna be stopping here soon because I went over a lot of information and I don't wanna, hold on one second here. I'm trying to get back to my slides. There we go. I don't wanna inundate you guys. I will be going over a lot of the assessment too tomorrow night. So if you wanna kind of hang tight, Work on your assignment too while I, you know, go over that tomorrow. Overload us. <laughs> I got to spread out the information here so you guys can digest it, have some time to think about it, and then get on to the next assignment. Is there anything that you want to talk about? Anything that you want to show? Any questions that you have? Anything you want me to go over at this point?
Not at this time. Okay. Very cool. Well, I will be here tomorrow at the same time. If you have any questions, if you want to show your work, get extra feedback, bring it in tomorrow. We can take a look at it, you know, do a critique or whatever. Um, completely up to you. Um, and I will go over kind of how to composite images for your assessment too tomorrow. All right. So you guys have a you have a wonderful day. Thanks for for being here, Marla. Appreciate it. I know you're the only one in here, so I'm picking on you. Um, and hopefully a lot of you guys will be listening to this recording. If you have any questions, let me know. And don't forget to get those discussions in. All right, have a great day. Thank you, you too. Stay, stay cool. And I'll hopefully see you tomorrow.